Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Where I come from in the tradition I was brought up in, this is the festival of Easter. It's the festival of rebirth, of new beginnings, uh, of rediscovering the vital, uh, unstoppable life force that powers this planet. So uh, it's an extra special time, I think, to be gathered here together, uh, thinking forwards, uh, remembering backwards, and coming together in the present to find new ways to rise to the challenge of living today at uh, this unprecedented time. I'm going to talk about fungi, and I know there's been some discussion of this already, um, so uh, that makes things a little bit easier, and because I can assume that you all uh, know about fungi. You know that this is a kingdom of life. Uh, you know that these are ecosystem engineers that underwrite the regenerative capacity of the living world. You know that there are lots of ways to be a fungus. I'm going to talk about a specific group of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi. And I know you've also heard something of mycorrhizal fungi, which is great. Um, so I can just give a small recap. Uh, and um, mycorrhizal fungi are fungi that form very intimate uh, and ancient relationships with plants. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask here, I'm going to hold the focus steady on the question of how can we nourish generative relationships with mycorrhizal fungi to support the flourishing of life on Earth and to help address the coupled crises uh, of climate change uh, and biodiversity loss. So, um, almost all plants depend on mycorrhizal fungi, uh, and these are fungi that form mycelial networks, uh, which are branching, fusing networks of tubular cells. And these fungi are uh, brilliant. They're chemical wizards. They're brilliant navigators in the wild, wet world of the soil. They're able to grow and remodel their bodies uh, and forage using their chemical ingenuity for nutrients, nutrients that plants need, like nitrogen and phosphorus. They acquire these nutrients and they supply these nutrients to their plant partners. And the plant partners, uh, in exchange for these nutrients, they provide the fungi with things that the fungi need to grow. Um, energy-containing carbon compounds like sugars and fats that the plants have made in photosynthesis. So this is a very intimate relationship. Uh, this image shows a micrograph at the plant material of a root. The plant material is in gray, um, and the fungus is, the mycorrhizal fungus is in red. Uh, in the image on the left, the root is present. In the image on the right, the root has been faded out. Uh, and you can see just quite how intense these relationships can be. And uh, this is really a, a, an intermingling of bodies. It's one of uh, the living world's great intimacies. I, I suppose I would say that, but I really do believe it. Um, and it is um, a, a, yeah, an astonishing way that organisms can come together to extend their reach uh, and to make things possible that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Now, this is really actually the roots of life on land. Uh, plants would only make it out of water and onto the land with the help uh, of their fungal associates, who behaved as their root systems for tens of millions of years until plants could evolve their own roots. This image shows uh, a different type of mycorrhizal fungus, an ectomycorrhizal fungus, uh, and you can see these root tips with a mycelial sleeve over them. And you can see the mycelial network extending out into the soil, navigating this multi-dimensional labyrinth of the soil uh, and doing um, the magic that they are able to do. Um, these are sophisticated relationships. It's very important to understand. Uh, at any one moment, a mycorrhizal fungus will be remodeling itself to explore the soil, one of the most complex habitats on the planet. It will be um, doing crazy things with its metabolism to forage and acquire nutrients. It will be forming relationships with crowds of microbes um, across its network. It will be diverting nutrients around its network, circulating them in just the right way to enable it to trade with its plant partners. It must be integrating information across an immense number of nodes, which at any one moment can be strung between multiple plants and sprawled over meters. In this video, you can see in real time the flow 
of carbon, of lipids, fats, through a mycorrhizal fungal network. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of these organisms as circulatory systems. So the influence of these quadrillions of trading decisions spills out over land masses and continents. Uh, a recent study that Toby and I were part of found that um, mycorrhizal fung fungi funnel around 13 billion tons of CO2 into the soil every year. That's as much as uh, a third of the total CO2 emissions produced by the burning of fossil fuels every year. It's a significant amount of carbon. They stabilize this carbon in the soil uh, and, um, and power soil food webs, uh, which contain m over half of, of all species on the planet. So globally, the total length of mycorrhizal fungal mycelium in the top 10 centimeters of soil is um, more than 450 quadrillion kilometers, which is um, over half of the width of the galaxy. These organisms are stationed at a vital point in global carbon and nutrient cycles, and they make up one of the circulatory systems of the planet, an ancient life support system that easily qualifies as one of the wonders of the living world. But despite their roles in supporting planetary biodiversity and regulating the Earth's nutrient cycles and climate, mycorrhizal fungi are a global blind spot, largely absent from climate change agendas, conservation strategies, uh, restoration strategies, agriculture, and forestry. And this is a problem. <laughs> it's a problem, first, because mycorrhizal fungi lie at the base of the food webs that sustain much of life on Earth and make a key lever in planetary ecology. And yet, hardly anyone is touching this lever. It would be like trying to perform life-saving life -saving surgery uh, without taking into account the circulatory systems of our bodies. It's a problem for another reason. Uh, what we are blind to, we tend to destroy. The destruction of underground ecosystems uh, accelerates climate change, biodiversity loss, and uh, what's more, when we disrupt these communities, we destroy an ancient library of solutions that fungi have evolved to rise to the challenge of living. Uh, we have no idea how many of these solutions might prove vital to life on Earth moving forward. When mycorrhizal fungi suffer, so do the organisms uh, and the ecosystems that depend on them. So, back to this question. How can we nourish generative relationships with these ancient life support systems to support the flourishing of life on Earth and respond to climate and biodiversity crises. I'm going to describe two projects that I work on with Toby, and Toby has uh, summarized these briefly. And uh, the first is, as Toby says, this grand, very big, zoomed out perspective. It's the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks, or SPUN. Um, and SPUN is trying to answer this question by taking a global perspective using huge data sets to map the mycorrhizal communities of the planet and advocate for their protection. The second approach zooms all the way in. We use advanced microscopy, robotics, machine learning tools to look inside mycorrhizal fungi to try and decode the flows and behavioral dialects of these living sensing networks. Uh, in both of these projects, we are seeking partners and funders uh, and collaborators and resources. So if you do feel moved, please do get in touch. Uh, you can find uh, various ways to do it on my website. So one of the ways we can form relationships with these ancient life support systems is by stopping destroying them. And um, Spun's work is trying to facilitate this. There are lots of threats to underground ecosystems, despite the fact that we think about them less than we should. Deforestation, desertification, over-application of uh, industrial um, agricultural chemicals like fungicides and um, fertilizers, um, over-plowing, any number of things, the list goes on. Uh, the combination, the result of all of this, 
combination is that, uh, based on current trends, 90% of the Earth's soils will be degraded by 2050. So SPUN is an organization working to map and protect mycorrhizal fungal communities, and in doing so, find, find ways to harness their power uh, to help mitigate and adapt to climate and biodiversity crises. Why map? Well, one of the reasons is that we know very, very little about who lives where underground. We have maps of ocean currents. We have maps of global vegetation. We have maps of global climate. Um, we don't have maps of mycorrhizal fungal communities. This limits our ability to monitor and to protect these key underground ecosystems. It limits our ability to work out which are the most important underground ecosystems to monitor and protect. So, um, SPUN's working to make these maps, make reliable maps that can inform decision makers and support legal actions to protect land from ecocidal exploitation. Uh, and to do so, we are, um, we are supporting the creation of a network, a decentralized network of scientists around the world um, and uh, funding people, funding these researchers and local communities to uh, answer um, mycorrhizal questions in their, in their places, in their homes, uh, in the ecosystems that they care about. Um, and all of this data comes back uh, to feed the very big models that we're making to build the global maps. Um, and it's a really exciting situation. We have uh, so, many, um, so many wild, enthusiastic uh, mycorrhizal researchers coming out of the woodwork, but building capacity for mycorrhizal research in, uh, in all over the world, and especially in places where this research has been less, um, this has, research has happened much less. Um, there's researchers in the Ivory Coast studying cacao plantations, researchers in Mexico using um, these mycorrhizal diversity uh, maps to engage local politicians to protect water sources. Um, there are people comparing the communities in humid and dry forests in Madagascar. Uh, it's hugely exciting. We're inundated with enthusiasm and requests and actually really struggling to keep up. Uh, and this is uh, a hugely gratifying. Um, so, to build these maps, we are um, we're taking thousands and thousands of these data points, um, which are these data sets themselves are being used to answer local questions in local places, um, but then come together to make these uh, large data sets, which we uh, then interpret using machine learning models that predict for every kilometer on the planet, uh, every pixel of Earth on the planet, uh, the mycorrhizal fungal diversity for the two main classes of mycorrhizal fungi. And, um, this is um, a big project, it's, it's computationally intensive, it's hugely exciting, uh, and the result is something like this. Uh, this map shows in brighter colors, it shows the areas of greater mycorrhizal diversity, this is for ectomycorrhizal fungi, one of the big classes of mycorrhizal fungi. The darker areas, the blue areas, show areas of uh, lower ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity. And one of the things that's interesting about this map is that it looks very different from a map of global diversity taking into account only organisms that live above ground. Usually, if you were to make a map of global biodiversity, you would just look at the organisms living above ground, and you would find that diversity was concentrated around the tropical regions and phased out as you went towards the poles. Uh, but that's not the case here. There are mismatches between biodiversity above ground and below ground, and this is one of the reasons why it's so important to take these below ground communities into account as we try to work out who lives where and what everyone's doing. Um, so here you can see there are very high uh, concentrations of ectomycorrhizal diversity around boreal forests in these more northerly latitudes. So building these maps of mycorrhizal fungal communities can help us to approach above-ground life from the perspective uh, of below-ground organisms. So why does this matter? Well, we think that these maps can help inform climate change strategies, restoration practices, um, land management of all sorts, um, and legal actions. Uh, these maps reveal that over 90% of mycorrhizal fungal hotspots are currently fall falling outside protected areas, which means that they're at immediate risk. Um, it doesn't, shouldn't surprise us. No, we have not been taking them into account when we've uh, prioritized our areas for conservation, uh, but this is nonetheless uh, a little shocking and certainly worrying um, 
and I think really should motivate uh, the turning of our attention towards these underground communities. So we're trying to quantify these threats, uh, and we have. And here is a map that shows a, what we call an integrated threat index, um, combining different kinds of threat to mycorrhizal fungal uh, ecosystem, mycorrhizal fungal communities and underground ecosystems. And the bright areas are areas of uh, high threat. The darker areas, the bluer areas, are of lower threat. And, um, and then we can integrate the threat to mycorrhizal fungal communities with mycorrhizal fungal diversity, and that's what you see here. So the, the brighter yellow areas, if you look at the top left, you'll see a little um, key. Um, so the brighter yellow areas are areas of high diversity, which are currently under a high level of threat. The greener areas are high diversity under a lower level of threat. Um, and the brighter red areas are low diversity areas under high threat. And, um, and the darker red areas, uh, the low diverse areas under lower threat. And so this is the kind of map that can form the basis for tools that we're developing to, um, to try and get these lives and the processes they oversee into the systems that we are making, into the systems that humans are, are designing, uh, into the hands of decision makers to empower them to make decisions to uh, support mycorrhizal fungal life uh, and to support the processes that they oversee. So I, I've been barking on about diversity and um, there's a reason for this. It's not just about the number of mycorrhizal fungal species living in a given place. Uh, it's because often, when it comes to mycorrhizal fungi, diversity really matters. The um, vital processes that mycorrhizal fungi oversee um, are coupled with mycorrhizal fungal diversity. So what we see, for example, is in areas of high ectomycorrhizal fungal diversity, there are um, very high soil carbon stocks. Um, so we can map these. Here you can see soil carbon stocks mapped together, uh, integrated with mycorrhizal fungal diversity to start to build a picture not only of who's living where, but also what everyone might be doing. And that really matters, what everyone might be doing. So thinking about fungi makes the world look different. Um, approaching above ground life from a perspective of the below ground life can really help us to uh, deepen and expand our understanding of planetary ecology. And one project that I'm really excited about right now is a, a collaboration uh, to test the application of this kind of fungal data set in legal actions. Um, we're working together with the More Than Human Rights Collective, some of whom are right here. Um, we're working together with the Fungi Foundation. Uh, we're working together with the Sariaku people of Amazonian Ecuador. Uh, and together with the Sariaku people, we're going to go uh, to visit the territory, and we're going to map the mycorrhizal communities of their territory, uh, and provide them with these data sets, which they can then use in their ongoing legal battles with the Ecuadorian government, uh, and use these data sets to make sure that the underground communities are protected Uh, because so much of the threats that these ecosystems face is from mining, which explicitly destroys the underground. So we're really, we're really thrilled at how this is uh, unfolding. We're thrilled about these um, coalitions that we're building and, and where this can go. So the second part um, I wanted to discuss is how we might form high-functioning relationships with mycorrhizal fungi by understanding how they do what they do. And for this, we have to zoom right in to make the invisible visible uh, and to study their behavior in real time. Remember, mycorrhizal fungi are uh, bathed in rich fields of sensory information. They must determine when, where, and how to move resources across their networks. Um, they must integrate myriad data streams across billions of nodes in their networks. These are complex information processing systems solving non-trivial problems on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and we have no idea how they can do what they do to achieve the astonishing feats that they achieve, right? These ecosystem engineers. So in Amsterdam, uh, with Toby's lab, uh, the lab of Tom Shimizuaki, biophysicist, collaborator, 
Um, we and amazing, amazing teams in these labs working to uh, decode the language of fungal information processing um, to allow us to ask how fungi are able to coordinate these flows um, to make decisions, to process information, uh, and how to do what they do. Um, so to do this, we have a custom-built imaging robot. You can see it here. This is generation one. We're working on generation two. Um, and uh, this robot allows us to quantify both the architecture of the fungal network, so the, the branching patterns, you can think of that as the, um, the map of the roads in a city, but also the flows within the network. So you can think of this as the traffic movement on the roads within the city. And we need to know both, uh, because it's in the flows that they're encoding information, but they're only able to do that by uh, creating the network and remodeling the network within which that information is flowing. So, um, it's something like this. You see on, on the left, you can see the, uh, the growing network in time lapse, so that's sped up. On the right, you can see it flows in real time uh, within a mycorrhizal fungal network. Uh, and we can get both of these levels of information and start to integrate them. Um, and the current system can track uh, over half a million fungal nodes across space and time. This is all uh, a very exciting study. It's in review at Nature right now, uh, and we're thrilled to see where this will go. But I really want to show you these videos of these flows uh, and invite you to look at this. So look at the way, this is real time. And, and if you were the size, if you could fit inside the network, and ride on these flows, it would feel like you were traveling at about 40 kilometers an hour. These are rapid flows of carbon and nutrients. They're changing direction. They're going in the opposite directions at once within the same section of pipe. Um, crazy things are happening at these branch points. And it's really quite wild. You know, we get together in the lab, and um, here's a video we love. Uh, we get together in the lab and sit in darkened rooms and look at these videos like children and just pulling our hair out. It's like, how? Are oh, they doing this? Look at this. You see, there's a blob. A blob at that junction in this video. It's going up the right-hand branch now. Watch it. It's going up the right-hand branch. And, oh, oh, no, no. It's going to come right back down. And what's going to happen? Oh, God. And what, what's going on? That's one node in one small network growing in one small dish in one laboratory in Amsterdam. <laughs> so um, what's great about these systems is that we can change the environmental conditions, we can simulate different climate regimes, we can simulate different nutrient regimes, we can look at how the flows change, we can look at how the fungi are, are designing their networks differently. And, um, and so we can build, and we are building, uh, high throughput data pipelines to, um, and machine learning models to start to combine all this information, to decode these um, systems of information processing, uh, to interpret this language uh, of fungal information processing. Um, and we want you to use these to deepen and expand our ability to interact with these organisms. So this is really it, I think, um, the point that I'm trying to make. That an understanding of mycorrhizal fungi as dynamic, sensing, information processing, problem solving agents can pave the way for new types of collaboration with these ancient life support systems that have for so long nourished and enriched life on this planet. These organisms are indispensable partners for humans as we navigate this time of crisis and transformation and look forward to the future of life on a damaged planet. Thank you.